The for-profit minibar, the for-profit toilet, the machine that charges you to pay for the toilet and the minibar. Very on brand for the Ferengi. Hello, Internet. I'm Ren, and today I want to talk about Star Trek Lower Decks Season 4, Episode 6, Parth Ferengi's Heart Place. This was another great episode. I really enjoyed seeing more of Ferenginar and, of course, seeing Rom and Lita from Deep Space Nine, who have a significant role in this episode. I loved the storyline with Rutherford and Tendi and the progression of Mariner's character, and we also got a fun, goofy little subplot with Boimler as well. It's a light-hearted episode, and it might have some of my favorite jokes this season. Ah! You're fired. Slug o cola. This happens to everyone who drinks it. I really love the writing in general, though, this season. It's always been great, but I feel like the writers hit their stride in a whole new way with season four, and it's great to see. Glad the studios are finally acknowledging them and paying them at least something resembling what they're worth. But that's all I can say without spoilers. This episode will contain spoilers for Star Trek Lower Decks and Deep Space Nine, at least as far as it concerns Rom and Lita. We start the episode aboard a Ferengi ship with two of their Lower Deckers. Why are we throwing out so many disruptors? Orders from the Grand Nagus. No more arms sales. We're going straight. Who are bickering when an alarm goes off. But these are worth a fortune! Rom doesn't care. He says equality and hospitality are more profitable in the long run. I want to be rich now! We're under attack! But one of them, Jeef, seems to be anticipating it. <laughs> right on time. They encounter the funny little destroyer ship, and the captain knows something is up and accuses Jeef of being involved and threatens to throw him out the airlock. Jeef, you're up to something. I can smell it. I don't know what you're talking about. I never trusted you. Throw him out the airlock. They told me we would make a profit. Before their ship is destroyed, like the others we've seen. This is a fascinating development that, of course, leads to more questions such as how this seemingly low-ranking Ferengi knew how to contact this ship, why he'd take that risk at all given the fates of the other ships that we've seen interact with it, and what was the profit he was expecting? Did it have something to do with the illegal weapons or something else? It's looking more and more like we're going to have to wait until the end of the season to find out, and it's killing me! In the A-plot, the Cerritos and the Toronto are visiting Ferenginar because the Ferengi have started the process of joining the Federation! Hell yeah! That's such an awesome step forward for them! I love it! You are about to witness the quickest signing in Starfleet history. These are the Ferengi, Admiral. I think we should be prepared for- A cakewalk? The Admiral thinks getting them to sign the application will be a cakewalk because of Rom and Lita's influence. <laughs> We're not dealing with the old Ferenginar anymore. Rom and Lita have brought so much progressive change. Captain Freeman tries to be more realistic and manage his expectations, but he is not in a listening mood. Respectfully, sir. The tenth rule of acquisition- Whoever's been attacking ships across the quadrant has disrupted their trade routes. Rom is desperate for Federation resources. Rom and Lita arrive, and they offer a bust of good fortune and a ceremonial invoice to accompany it. The B-plot, which sort of has three distinct subplots, starts back aboard the Cerritos. The Lower Decks gang are working on a shuttle until they are interrupted by Ransom, who gives them travel guide duty. Lieutenant Junior's grade? Lieutenant's junior grade? Whatever. You four just pulled the most coveted job at Starfleet. Travel guide duty! As a side note, the shuttle is the Sequoia, and they have that little drawing of the little Lower Decks gang on it, and I just think that's precious. Anyways, they're basically tasked with traveling around Ferenginar and reviewing various bars. Ooh. Starfleet's gonna foot the bill for us to go to as many bars, restaurants, bars, hotels, pubs, bars, saloons, cantinas, and bars as we want. And maybe some historical sites as well. Also museums, historical sites, but basically, yeah, it's mostly bars. Boimler has already decided he's going to go full Boimler TM on this one. How many places do people usually review? I don't know, four or five? Great! I'm gonna do 40. I'll pack my schedule so full that I do everything and enjoy nothing. Ransom also wants Tendi and Rutherford to pretend to be married. We also need someone to act as a couple. You want us to pretend to be married and review stuff? Don't play with me, Lower Decks. My weak little shipper heart can't take it. Mariner knows Ransom actually pulled some strings to give them this fun job. You pulled some strings to get us assigned to travel guide duty, didn't you? I might have had something to do with it. Ugh, why is it so weird when you're nice? It's nice that they're being consistent about their relationship becoming less hostile. They arrive on Ferenginar, which is really fun because we've hardly ever gotten to see much of it before. The group scatters into their distinct subplots. Mariner wanders off to meet up with a friend, Boimler runs off to start on his itinerary, and... Tendi and Rutherford are left alone to cosplay as married. We got married at a wedding! They're so cute! I need them to actually get married, please! Yeah, I love being married to my husband! I love you too! The blushing, I can't! 
They start to chicken out and try to return to the ship, but they're stopped by a Ferengi who pulls out all the stops for the young lovers with a deluxe couples package. Boimler arrives in his hotel room full of endless microtransactions. We got the for-profit minibar, the for-profit toilet, the machine that charges you to pay for the toilet and the minibar. Very on brand for the Ferengi. He's about to head off to the Museum of Bribery when he's distracted by a commercial which the lucky bastard has never seen before. Then he starts watching TV and gets absorbed by cop landlords. We love a capitalist copaganda show, a staple in American television as well. Mariner meets up with her friend Quimp, a monocled Ferengi who congratulates her on her latest promotion, and they start day drinking, which she escalates in classic Mariner fashion. Back aboard the Toronto, the negotiations are underway. Rom wants to slip in a provision about baseball because he loves it almost as much as I love the DS9 baseball episode. It's a boiler oh. plate. Do you still play baseball? We should put in there that Ferenginar gets to play baseball. I like baseball. It's fun. And then casually asks about changing the numbers in the application. I'm just a former bartender, but I was looking at the numbers and was wondering if they could be different. Lita distracts him with a baseball and takes the Admiral aside. You were saying, First Clerk? If we can open up the document and let him shuffle around a couple of numbers, he'll feel like he accomplished something. I don't see any problem with that. Captain Freeman also takes the Admiral aside because she has a shrewd read on the situation. <clears throat> this is a classic dumb cop, reasonable cop routine. But if we Thank open you the for the input, Captain, but we'll be fine. One, He's practically two. a child. But he falls for it anyways. They sit back down at the table and Lita starts in on them. Then we'll move to the tariffs on Ferengi exports to outlying territory. Rom's demeanor shifts as well. Nation vis a vis the great Ferengi people and our reluctant acceptance of your federation. She means bribes. They've been hustled. Back on Ferenginar, Boimler is still watching TV. He's not even put off by the obvious product placements. Buddy, I just need to enjoy the crisp, refreshing taste of a Sluggo Cola. Ha <laughs> uh, they put commercials in the shows? After the end of Landlord Cops, he gets sucked into Will They, Won't They? I'm sorry, what? Oh, Blago, I don't know what to do. I'm secretly in love with Numa, but she's engaged to Bob. He's not going anywhere anytime soon. Tendi and Rutherford are in, like, a 1980s honeymoon suite where everything is heart-shaped. And they're still definitely pretending that they're only pretending to be super in love with each other. Yeah, it's like, who decided that hearts are the universal symbol for love? If anything, it should be kissy lips or gorgeous green eyes. Or something. Damn it, Lower Decks. Don't you dare dangle this in front of me. Parth interrupts with a couple's photo session complete with a wardrobe change. The outfit reveal is adorable. They're like high schoolers seeing each other dressed up for a dance or something. It's precious. Wow, you look so handsome. Thanks. And you look, uh, captivating? Sorry. Meanwhile, Mariner is drinking heavily at the public library with Quimp. This poor, innocent guy bumps into Quimp and apologizes profusely. Oh my goodness! Uh, a thousand apologies, oh, good not sir. A I've been a proper fool. And of course, I'll you reimburse- you But Mariner tries to start a bar fight, even though he definitely doesn't want to fight her. Madam, please. I'm just trying to enjoy an evening out with the rest of my biker gang. Resulting in a brawl with his biker gang. They were just trying to enjoy an evening out, the poor little guys. On the Toronto, the Admiral is looking defeated as Rom and Lita continue to kick his ass in negotiations. Rom invites them back to his palace to finally sign the application. I believe we're almost wrapped Ooh, up. I have an idea. Let's finish at my palace. Much better photo op for the signing. And once again, Captain Freeman knows what's up. Fine. <clears throat> He's making you feel like you're close, then delaying to make you frustrated enough to sign anything. <laughs> but the Admiral is a sucker, so he doesn't listen. Tendi and Rutherford go out to eat at Quark's Federation Experience. Even more romantic stuff is being pushed on them. So sorry, the waiter gave you the standard menus. He didn't know you were here for our deluxe romance package. And they're just about to come clean. Arth, buddy, you're a top-notch hug shears, but we have to come clean. When another pair of diners are publicly shamed. It looks like we've caught two people lying about being a couple to defraud our company out of a discount. Charged with a felony and I guess immediately convicted and sentenced to a lifetime working in the subaquatic sulfur mines. Talk about a prison industrial complex. Tendi and Rutherford are forced to eat sexy chocolate statues and praise each other's attractiveness in lie detecting chairs. But we only get to see their last compliments to each other. Tendi's got fun hair. Uh, I like your hair too. And I feel a little cheated because I was expecting a cute extended scene where they give each other lots of awkward compliments. Like it was still sweet, I was just expecting more of it. They try to force them to 
consummate the marriage in a very public box, but luckily Miglimo lets the cat out of the bag. Devana, Samantha, what a coincidence! These are famously the two closest platonic friends on my ship! Huh? Platonic? Uh, Security! Um... And Tendi and Rutherford do some... improvising to save themselves. You've been trying to break up our love from the start! Uh, yeah. You know we both love you. You do? Just because the Ferengi newlywed discount can only be used by two out of the three of us, you have the nerve to come down here and try to ruin our marriage? Security stands down, and they offer Miglimo a homewrecker package for his stay. Can I interest you in our homewrecker package? <laughs> you don't have to throw up in my mouth twice. Let's do it. I know we haven't seen a lot of Miglimo, but he's one of my favorite side characters. Mariner's friend bails her out of jail, and he's understandably pissed at her. And calls her out on her self-destructive behavior. Usually your chaos means something, but it's weird this time. You seem angry about nothing. Yeah, but he does do it in a very kind and insightful way. Oh, immature. You have all the support you ever wanted. Nobody to scream at or rail against. And look at you. Still picking fights to make sure you get hurt. What? He seems like a sweetie. We love Quimp. Mariner, I love you, but you need to figure out whatever's eating you up inside. <laughs> I also love this bit about the monument to lost prophets. So much lost income! Is there no justice in this galaxy? 10 out of 10 Ferengi vibes. At their palace, Lita and Rom continue destroying the Federation in negotiations. And 10 points on the back end of every hollow novel program in perpetuity. Uh, I don't think they have back end, but yes, yes! Up to and including getting the Admiral to do this sad little dance. Uh huh. Also, the Nagus would like you to dance for him. He just keeps going. It had me wheezing. The expression on his face here just kills me. Bless these animators, their visual comedy is always just mwah. While he dances, Captain Freeman gets Rom to sign an application with very generous terms. I've made those changes and added a billion bars of gold press latinum as a signing bonus. Uh, what? And one minor contingency. Before you receive any of these signing bonuses, you must recruit one other planet yourself since you're so good at it. After he signs, Captain Freeman tells them to read the fine print. Planet, but I didn't say which planet. You might want to read the fine print. Before you receive any of the- Kronos the Klingon homeworld? It's impossible! No, oh, I know. And reminds them of the eighth rule of acquisition. You forgot the eighth rule of acquisition. Small print leads to large risk. <gasps> and Rom is genuinely pleased that she- Swindled like a true Ferengi. The Admiral insists he had nothing to do with it, but Rom and Lita go on and on about what a good impression she's just made. As much as we're in favor of joining the Federation, the Grand Nagus can't sign with a bunch of suckers and rubes. Rom agrees to go ahead and sign the standard papers. Captain Freeman, you showed me that there are those in the Federation who respect our culture. Bring me the standard papers. I'll sign. And the Admiral gives a well-deserved apology to Captain Freeman. Please accept my apologies. I shouldn't have doubted you. I'll be relaying your acuity to command. To close out the B-plot, Ransom checks in with the gang. Mariner has maybe learned a lesson, but either way has a terrible hangover. Rutherford and Tendi are back to being oblivious. Yeah, we just don't have any natural chemistry. Wanna help me reroute that face conduit? Sure! God damn it. And Boimler is still watching TV and has gone completely feral in the process. Boimler, did you do too many locations? Are you in need of aid? Uh, no. I watched eight hours straight of Ferengi programming. But Ransom is pleased that he's chilled out a bit. I'm proud of you. Really? You've always had a problem going with the flow, but today it looks like you got out of your own way. Though he still has him dragged out by Ferengi authorities and laughs at Boimler's antics while he sips on some sluggo cola, which I now want to try. Listen, it's not my fault. I am just very suggestible and advertising works on me. This was such a fun, lighthearted episode, but it still had some delightful character moments. I like that Mariner's self-destructive behavior isn't just solved in one episode, but is an ongoing personal problem that even she doesn't fully understand the root of. Maybe she should book a little bit more time with Migli Mode between his strange new meals. My species invented space travel in order to seek out strange new meals. I loved the stuff with Rutherford and Tendi, but if they don't pay it off and just keep teasing us, I'm going to be upsetty. Because they're so cute, and their attraction to each other is just so well-established with a strong bedrock of friendship and affection. It's so cute and healthy, I need it. If they're just gonna leave Rutherford and Barnes broken up, I really want to see him end up with Tendi. Boimler's TV subplot was a lot of fun. 
I'm kind of curious why they still haven't dealt with any repercussions from his death yet this season. I guess it wasn't as big of a moment as I thought it was. Either way, the Ferengi TV jokes definitely made me laugh, and it was great seeing a change of pace for Boimler. The aesthetic of Ferenginar was really cool, and most of the capitalism jokes they made got laughs out of me. I think they hit just the right notes of attempting to meaningfully portray Ferengi culture while still hitting the right satirical and comedic notes on a society that has always seemed absolutely wild, even in its more nuanced iterations. You see, when a Ferengi of my father's stature dies, the body is automatically vacuum desiccated and sold as a prize collectible. I really enjoyed seeing Captain Freeman out Ferengi the Ferengi, pulling a chain way. We have to out Ferengi. The Ferengi. I will forever giggle when I think about the Admiral's little dance. I loved seeing Rom and Lita again, and I like that the plot started with the Admiral underestimating Rom, as people are so prone to do, and rapidly getting in over his head. Rom and Lita's dynamic is also just so much fun. This episode was a perfect follow-up on beloved characters from Deep Space Nine, and it made me so, so happy. But that's just my opinion. What did you think about this episode? Any theories about the mysterious ship? Do you think it's Peanut Hamper or Badgie on a Rampage, as some have suggested in the comments of previous videos? What did you think about Lower Dex's take on Ferenginar? Let me know in the comments down below. Like, share, and subscribe for more videos. See you next time. Peter Zane.